Okay, so welcome to the launch of Sarah's excellent book. Uh, Some houses are built without walls. I'm Roger Bloor of Clayanga Press, and it's been a real pleasure to work with Sarah uh, over the last month or so, getting this into into print. And I've heard her read before at a, a, pre, a, a launch of an exhibition, and you're in for a treat this evening. And I'm in for a treat because I'm going to have a rest for the rest of the evening because I'm going to sit back and relax and enjoy it and hand over the responsibilities for hosting this to Vanessa Lampert. Vanessa, if you don't know her, um, is a poet. She's a fellow co-editor of The Alchemy Spoon and a serial prize winner. She never stops winning prizes um, for poetry. So I'll hand over to Vanessa and I shall sit back and relax. Thank you very much for that. That was lovely. And hello everyone and thank you so much for coming to this celebration and launch of Sarah Levy's debut pamphlet, Some Houses Are Built Without Walls, from the wonderful Clayhanger Press. Sarah's going to read first, followed by readings from her guest Jenny Pagden, and then Sarah will finish with a further set of poems. If you feel moved to do so, please unmute and show your passionate appreciation at the end of each reading. <laughs> But for the rest of the time, if you could just stay on mute and it stops the, the readings from being disturbed. Thank you. I'm going to tell you a little bit more about Sarah. She's a recent graduate of the Newcastle University and Poetry School MA in writing poetry. She regularly performs her work and her poems have been placed in various national and international competitions and published in a number of magazines and anthologies. I think it's a really generous poet who privileges the stories of others in her work, particularly in her first collection. And in this one, Sarah has lent her voice to the sick, the silent and the marginalized, all of them who died a really long time ago. But they're remembered and honored in these pages. And through this pamphlet, something of them survives. The pamphlet arises from Sarah's poetry research project at the University of Staffordshire Record Office, which permitted her access to 19th century admissions data, photographs and correspondence from three asylums as they were then known. Sarah has recorded poems from this book for inclusion on sound posts at the welcome funded Staffordshire Archives and Heritage Exhibition, A Case for the Ordinary, which tours this year. The following is an excerpt from In Memory of W.B. Yeats by W.H. Auden, after which Sarah will read. And I think this says everything um, that I would like to say only better than I ever could. For poetry makes nothing happen. It survives in the valley of its making where executives would never want to tamper. Flows on south from ranches of isolation and the busy griefs raw towns that we believe and die in, it survives, a way of happening, a mouth. That's beautiful, thank you so much Vanessa and uh, what a lovely introduction, thank you. Thank you everybody for joining us this evening on St Agnes Eve um, and coming out on this really cold evening to join us. So as Vanessa mentioned, I've used the archive um, and the language in it uh, consequently is at times uh, incompatible with our modern understanding of mental ill health. And I sort of put that in as a disclaimer. This first poem uh, includes an old Romany word, lunan, which means young woman. I am. I am cutting holes in water. Am I already dead? I am. Beelzebub's daughter, am I tomorrow to be wed? I am drowning here forever. Am I a lunan lost? I am searching for my treasure. Am I the Holy Ghost? I am wisps of smoke on water. Am I dressed in clothes on fire? I am a lamb to slaughter. Am I dancing on a spire? I am here, but know not where this is. I am here, but I am lost. Next poem is called The Examination Room. 
Upon admission, patient was found to be in frail health and unresponsive to basic questions. Doctor enters the room. His maggot words drop to the floor, ignored. I am listening to you with my teeth. Hover like a blue bottle above this almost corpse. As doctor searches for the distant crackle of breath in foamy bellows, prods the bale tripe of slack belly, pull back the shuttered lids, peer in a vacant room, table scrubbed almost white, chipped bowl, a piece of spoiled meat, a fly. This next poem, as if by magic, we have an image on screen. And this gentleman is called Andrew Grant. He was age 20 and he was a proselytizer. God spoke to me. From New York to England, I pilgrimed the ocean, pushed on by faith and fair weather. I preached as I traveled, Bible in hand, spreading the word of God as it came to me, clear as a bell in the night. Fulfilling my mission, I spoke outside taverns, in town squares, on market days, waylaying passers-by, stopping the shoppers and sharing the scriptures, charged with the task of saving each soul in the towns that I toured. Children threw stones at me. Innkeepers cursed me for scaring off trade. I was pilloried, laughed at. My language grew stronger, my sermons more desperate. Why were they turning their backs on salvation? My liturgies deemed a disturbance. Arrested, I passed from prison to workhouse, but would not stop praying and seeking forgiveness for those that derided me, would not be parted from my one prized possession. Would not put it down when I reached the asylum, fearing God might forsake me, not for doctors or nurses, not when they sat me in front of a camera and the devil said, come fella, hands in your lap now. There's a good chap. Let go of that Bible. Be still. Reasons for admission. Because 16 children, because painful hair, because voices in the walls, because found her husband hanged, because vagina is a devil to be fed, because a dog surprised him, because lost at heaven's gates, because ruined hopelessly, because gunpowder beneath the bed, because poison in the porridge, because death of a child, because angels come to whip him every night. So this was one of the redacted poems that I made and this is how it appears in the book. It's just a bit easier if I read the words out. The Rules of Lunacy. Post-mortem, every lunatic vision shall be kept, contained in the curated body. Count any peculiar vascular organs. Tongue, the absence of bruises, the phenomena of disorder. A change in disposition displays itself by a morbid failure of memory and has to undergo 
a course of special mechanical restraint. All accidents and injuries must be the last. Thank you so much. Please let us um, um, uh, give Sarah a big round of applause. I love Amazing. your poems. I love them. They're just so dark and lovely. Maybe there's something wrong with me. I don't know. Really, I'm not articulate <laughs> and to use those words, but I really felt that I was in in the asylum with those people. I could like smell it. It was yeah. I just like the the morose of it all. I just I love I love your writing. Thank you for sharing. Thank you. It's also really lovely to see those the pictures as well, the original documents. I think that's really mm. fun. It just brought them to life. It was just so moving. Mm. Thank you, Sarah. And now we have Sarah's guest, Jenny Pagden. Jenny studied, studied for a BA in English at Oxford and an MA in Creative Writing at the University of East Anglia. Her pamphlet, Called Beck, which tells the story of her postnatal psychosis, was published by Eyewear in 2017, shortlisted for the Mislexia pamphlet competition and listed by the Poetry Book Society. Her full collection manuscript, In the Snow Globe, is currently being considered by publishers. Jenny won the 2020 Alumno Norwich City Wall Commission and the Cafe Writers Norfolk Prize 2017. She was long listed for the Rebe Rebecca Swift Foundation Women's Poetry Prize 2018 and shortlisted in the Second Light Competition 2021. Her work is featured or forthcoming in New Welsh Review, Smoke, Magma, Ambit, The Stand, Wild Court, Finnish Creatures, Ink, Sweat and Tears and the Emma Press Anthology of Contemporary Gothic Birth. If we could all put ourselves on mute, it would be lovely. And here's Jenny. Thank you very much for that introduction, Vanessa. Lovely. I'm going to get stuck straight in. Um, the title of the first poem comes from a line in Thomas Hardy. So his poem is called An Autumn Rain Scene. On whom the rain comes down. People do say never to touch a tent that's heavy with water. I barely even knew a woman could get ill and hurt her child. They said our baby could have downs. For six months, the odds were penciled on the wardrobe while my auntie, cousins, friends succumbed to cancers, fraud or death. They said our baby might have infantile hypotonia. Then he fainted and wouldn't come round. I was sick and fainted and was sick, sick, sick. And still it rained down, cross hatching the sky. This one is what to pack for the called back mother and baby unit. At least one floaty evening dress. Back remedies in a floral case. An empty purse for emergencies. Cheese for parties. A magic book that reads itself. Your true colours and a heart to wear pinned to the outside of your sleeve. A pair of slippers a list of false names for your child. Okay, the next poem is Krista. Like the twin I never had, you came calling unannounced, wheeling your bike. The differences between us slight, China for Lebanon, making art, not poetry. After the first year, a train undid you, my husband forbidden seen my sake. The second year, I crossed an unmarked, unfenced railway track in front of the unannounced 1017, and later that morning forgot the existence of my baby, trailing scarves, a rainbow in a doctor's bag to the psychiatric hospital, where the doors look out, the wind, sorry, where the windows look out on indoors, the doors all locked on bars and fences. My indigo shawl, fractured wings. After the stigmata, it took the first week to have breakfast. 
the second to find my program. The third week was packing, packing, and in the fourth I wrote, finally broken, as a horse is broken in, undignified. There were some long nights in the first few months of my son's life. I'm going to step back slightly in time to the first one. Night crossing one, labour. And when she took away the gas and air, I didn't know how I'd get across to the next one. Heavy, pressed bare against the rails, my hand still grasping for the mask. I never cried until she stitched me up. It's like a jigsaw. You beached upon my chest, latching. And night crossing two, insomnia. Making the terrible crossing till 6 a.m. I chart a course through songs of Leonard Cohen, watching the window in the door, turning my iPod wheel like a little helm, and lie down with the sisters and Suzanne, and find the lines for grief, the lines for shame, and taste the small rain falling from my cheek, and breathe the thin stars rising through my lungs. Um, daytimes on the ward were also long and dreamlike. This is the radio times. The TV in the hospital is on all day cannot be switched off, too loud, colours too saturated. But every actor is someone you know from the world outside and the History Channel is telling you what your nan, your nan, is like. This week's blind date features your workmates, wedding rings of 50p, with the key to creation flashing up at you just before you watch the weather. Two tiny poems here. Insanity. My mind blew open so wide I couldn't trust the sun to set. And sanity was like trying to make a sandwich out of breadcrumbs. Banged up. Watching the sunset, eye to the keyhole, night after night. When I first arrived, I still thought I could astral travel, or I thought I might follow clues to find treasure, a merry hunt. I never forced the ground floor doors, though I watched others fail at it, and I did call the fire brigade once. I was starting to wonder if I would fly. It was finally my mother who told me, look, take responsibility for the child. And after that, I breathed it. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you so much, Jenny. Those were wonderful poems, beautifully read and really moving. Thanks so much. Ooh. Jenny, that was amazing. Oh, that line as giddying, giddying as an oak packed into an acorn. Mm. Fabulous. This is a great book, by the way, everyone. <laughs> Paul Beck, I do recommend. Do we, did we put the link in the chat somewhere? Do buy it, it's superb. Sorry, Thank Nath, I'm doing a job for you. Thank you, Sarah. Um, Sarah, before you read again, I just wondered if I could ask you a couple of questions. And um, the first one is, what attracted you to, um, to this particular topic of all the things I remember us talking about what you were going to do for your MA and yeah. saying things like for God's sake just write something woman <laughs> <laughs> um, so I, I'd like to know how you were lighted here um so the, the subject of asylums I, I've, I've come to the conclusion that um it's just kind of in my blood I, where I grew up in in Wales I see that my father is on screen so he'll back me up on it um, we, we lived in a house for a while next to a, a large convent and it was a closed order so no one came out she seemed just so sinister to me I was just absolutely puzzled by it and 
they had a massive wall. It seemed massive to me, massive brick wall between us and them. And it was topped with broken glass. And I just spent, I spent a lot of time wondering, was that wall to keep them in or to keep the world out? And it, it just felt, it felt mad. It felt absolutely mad. And from there, I was sent to boarding school um, just down the road from Denby, what was Denby Mental Hospital. And uh, again, lots of walls, walls between them, walls between us. But occasionally patients escaped and our school used to get uh, a phone call to tell us that, that they, they'd lost somebody because they would invariably be found wandering in, in the grounds of our school. And weirdly, for the last sort of 15 years, I've lived in a house that's built in the grounds of what was a very large mental hospital, Colney Hatch Mental Hospital. And I, I just found myself wondering about those, those big stone walls and what was behind them, what went on behind them. And I, I just like the idea of, of giving a voice to the silence of that. So mm. I think that would, and that, that kind of feeds into the, to the name of the book as well. Yeah, tell me about that because it strikes me that um, a lot of what you're saying and um, in a way what Jenny has been saying is about being walled in in some way and uh, mm. your book, your title says something else without walls. So can you explain that? Yeah, the, the working title for the book for quite a while was Disordered Minds. Um, and I know Roger was, was quite keen on that. And then I started, I, I chanced on this idea of interweaving sort of obscure nursery rhymes into the into some of the poems, um, really old nursery rhymes that, that I'd not heard before, but that would have been around at the time that, that I, the patients that I'm writing about. And I found that line in, in one of the nursery rhymes. And it, it really resonated with me. As soon as I read that, I, it made me think about the patients and how they were kind of cut off from reality and and incarcerated inside their own minds way before they were incarcerated inside asylums. So um, that, that kind of, yeah, that worked. And I think the, the nursery rhyme that that is taken out of is printed inside the, the cover of the book for those that have it, for those that are about to have it. Does that answer your question? <laughs> I think it does, but I, I was also thinking that in some ways people um, who are suffering from mental illness are also don't have the same kind of walls as people who are so-called not mentally ill, you know, oh. kind of oh. different walls are different, aren't they? Yeah, yeah, very much so. Yeah, the, the whole walls image was just running right the way through this book. There was another line that I, I found that a patient kept describing the asylum that they were in as their stone mother, and it, it was sort of something that was keeping them in, but it was kind of holding them safe as well. And that, that kind of, that resonated. Thank you very much. Will you read some more for us? Yeah, all right. Thank you. A few more. I think we're going to share an image. We are, as if by magic. So this is another redaction poem. Um, this is just the title of the poem. Dissolving views in the evening, a tour of the animated asylum, commencing at o'clock. Empty cloud faces stare in the airing courts, pacing out circles, all foggy eyed, dream walkers dragging their heels. But at night, minds like bird cages open and dormitories hum with excitement, a chatter of chaffinches, flutter of memories, fretting lost children, the setting on fire of petticoats, spit in the eye of a woman who looks at you askance, the whispering blasphemies, eyes in the walls, they are watching you, plans being hatched to poison the porridge, dispatch you. Take off your clothes, for the devil is sewn in the lining, your pockets are burning, your heads full of feathers and fishermen hidden beneath beds quite invisible, waiting with nets to pounce and surprise you, hook out your eyes, you smuggled a bottle of chloroform, cut holes in the water, lost hold of your daughter, purchased a ticket to heaven, and sought her. Visiting day. 
the shame of it. Briskly offloaded from a train at a place they call Lunatics Junction to a tramcar that edges steep up the incline, dragging us gaggle of visitors, nervously clutching our gifts, homemade pies, knitted socks, sketches of little box houses, four windows, smoke chimney, from children who ask, when will daddy come home? No one makes small talk. Fingers twist shawls. We eye with suspicion our carriage companions. Do they have it too, in the blood? As the tram car clears the crest of the hill, that first glimpse, bigger, much bigger than ever imagined, grand, like a palace of madness, a giant brick wasp's nest, humming with chaos, asylum. Even the word makes me shudder. Yes, take my cue from Roger. Another image that the image that you're looking at on screen, you can see him. It's actually my favourite picture that I found in the archive. And he's a guy called Arthur Sims. He was just 25 and his profession was listed as music master. And I just love the way he's touching his ear. So sensitive. This poem is called Lost Notes. The music professor would sit at the asylum piano, play the most complex of Handel concertos, filling the corridors with such sweet melodies, wrung from the keys at phenomenal speed as the Holy Spirit and angels chattered. The voices of all the dear departed prattled on like a restless, fidgeting concert audience, hot fingers sweeping the piano keys to deaden the drone of cacophonous noise, until doctors agreed that a bloodletting might be employed to calm his composure, steady the mania, slow down his music from tumbling torrents, rapids and raging of rivers, babbling brooks to a stream of semi-quavers, trickle of crotchets, bubbled one by one. He saw them pool in the little dish, his dark tadpoles, minims of sound, each note bled away into silence. When I was writing this next poem, I was thinking about a quote that I'd read from the French writer Colette. And she wrote this about her nine-year-old daughter, Belle de Zou. I shall speak the truth. I don't much like my daughter sewing. She is silent when she sews, silent for hours on end and why should I not write down the words that frighten me? She is thinking. My eye. Quiet at my embroidery, I promise you, I am at my most dangerous, mother. I am thinking. When I hold the metal up to the light, the better to thread the yarn, peer through the eye of that needle, and fix you in my gaze through the small aperture. I am looking directly into your soul through the small aperture and fix you in my gaze. Peer through the eye of that needle, the better to thread the yarn. When I hold the metal up to the light, mother, I am thinking, I promise you, I am at my most dangerous, quiet, at my embroidery. 
poets amongst you would have noticed that that was a specular. I'm very worried about saying that because I fear every time I'm going to say speculum. <laughs> um, so it's a, a mirror of itself. It turns back on itself in a mirror. Before I read my last poem, I thought I'd jump in quick and say some thank yous. So firstly, I just want to thank everybody out there, friends and family, for, for buying the book, for turning up tonight, for supporting me. I want to thank Jenny Pagden, my wonderful guest reader. Jenny, I love those poems. And that book was just vital to me when I was writing my dissertation and bring this collection together. Big thanks to Vanessa Lampert, tonight's mistress of ceremonies, and to my tutors, Glyn Maxwell and Tammy Yosliff. To Tammy and Femi Oyabude for their generous endorsements of the book. The staff of Staffordshire Record Office for granting me access to their archive. But my biggest thank you of all is reserved for Roger Bloor of Clayhanger. He is truly the most patient man I have ever encountered. Roger has patiently answered my email queries at midnight, guided me through getting this book into print and done it all with grace and good humour. Roger, thank you. My last poem is not about a patient, but a staff member, a male attendant aged 31, whom sadly I couldn't find a photo of. For context, male and female staff in the asylums were strictly segregated into different wings, but our man found a way around this. Joseph Chalmer steps out. Joseph Chalmer steps out through his skylight, grabs fistfuls of night, fingers reach for the pin-headed stars, scales the rooftop, deft as an acrobat, finding her window unlatched. Come dawn, Ellen kisses the love-addled lad from her bed, dismisses him to skywalk his way home. She knows these trysts risk too much. Soon, this madness must end. She sends back his love letters, bolt shut her window. Red-eyed and raging, he curses her, curses each man that dares look at her, retreats to the rooftop to sit in despair, swings his legs from the parapet, tells the deft stars of his heartbreak, her callousness, drops stone after stone into darkness and smiles as they smash to the courtyard below, stares up at the lunatic moon, looming bigger tonight, so close, he could stand up and stroll off to join it. So one last time, Joseph steps out into air. Thank you. Thank you so much. This has been wonderful. And thank you so much to you, Jenny, as well. I'm going to hand you back to Roger to close this. Thanks, Roger. Well, what an excellent evening. Um, there's nothing better than, than hearing poems brought to life, and that's what both Sarah and Jenny have, uh, have done. Um, if, well, you've published a few books. Uh, nobody asks you which your favourite book is, because if you like to say which your <laughs> favourite child is. Uh, Sarah did ask me whether this was the most challenging one that I'd ever published. <laughs> it's, it's the one I've learned most from, I think, is probably the, probably the answer. But it's a brilliant publication and the, the travelling exhibition, which Sarah has got the notes in, it, the, the poems in, is, is brilliant as well. It, it opens up these archives, these stories of people from the three asylums in Staffordshire and, and gives them a life and tells 
the stories of unheard voices, which again is, is what poetry can do. So thanks so much to everyone for turning up. Don't forget that Gallant Little Presses survive on book sales and uh, put the link to that. And also I put the link to Jenny's book in the chat earlier on. So thanks to all our readers, to all our guests and have a good evening and cheers to Sarah. Cheers. Well done. Cheers. Congratulations. Well done. Congratulations. Well done. Congratulations. Well done. 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 <laughs> Love you. I'm in the lounge. I'll have a cup of tea. Just <laughs> <laughs> sod. <laughs> no, I'll just spoil a girl, don't you? <laughs> oh, I get anything stronger than tea. <laughs> I'm making it. I'm making it. A little bit of prosecco might help. <laughs> oh, brilliant. Oh, thank you, everyone. That was so much fun. No, it's our pleasure. It's our pleasure. Really it's absolutely massive. amazing. Yes. Thank you, Sarah. Congratulations. Uh, There's only three copies left on this on that website that the link. So I've just uh, so if you haven't uh -huh. got a copy, we're not going to be able to get one. So there's only three. No, copies you will. Left. We'll keep on printing it. Oh, keep yeah, printing, okay. keep printing. Thanks, <laughs> All right, my darling. I'm going to go. Thank you so much. Uh, I love you, right, Thank you for tuning in. Yeah. Wedding. Thank you. Yes. yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the bed in the bed. Right, cool. Bye, I'm gonna come on. I'm gonna come on. Tea's ready. Tea's ready. <laughs> thank you, everyone. Thank you, Vanessa. Thank Hi, you, darling. So much. Bye, Bye, Sarah. Fabulous. Bye, Bye Sarah. Bye, Sarah. Bye, Glenn. Bye, Sarah. Bye, Sarah. Bye, 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 I remember you, Sarah. That was fantastic. Oh, thank you. Well, I've got a little sign at the top that says David's Network Network Bandwidth is loud. Who are I told you not to oh. tell anybody? <laughs> it's our, secret. our little secret, darling. <laughs> <laughs> thank you for tuning in. <laughs> Oh, thank you so, so much for letting us know about this. It oh, was fantastic, really good, really powerful, and really emotional as well. So, so thank it, you. it was it was yeah. the stage, it was the actors, it was the scene. You just set everything. Thank oh, you. That was thank absolutely you. yeah. I was I was drawn in. Thank you so much. Thank you, darling. Oh. Yeah, well done, Sarah. First of many readings, I'm sure. Let's hope. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. All the best. Keep us posted. All right. Take care. Take care. Bye 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 bye. bye. <laughs> bye. bye. It's a fabulous launch. Well done, and uh, I look forward to seeing you at Stafford Lit Fest in May. Oh yes, fantastic. Well, good to see you. Yeah. Yeah, and you. Oh, I couldn't get my camera to come on early. I don't know what was going on. Some mad technical thing. Oh, no, 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 no,